Hi Marketer, it's Ty here, and in today's episode of Lean Mean Marketing Teams, you hear from Sharon Parker, Director of the Centre for Transformative Work Design at Curtin University. In this episode, we discuss three topics that are extremely pertinent in the uncertain times that we're currently in. Firstly, we discuss the future of work and how digitization and automation are impacting on jobs and skills of the future. We also have an interesting chat about the responsibility that managers have to use technology as a force for good and not evil. Next, we discuss the concept of work design and the smart work design framework that Sharon has developed. This smart work design framework is really interesting. It includes things like A for agency and T for tolerable work demands, encompassing how much autonomy and control staff have over the work, and how cognitive and emotionally demanding and stressful their work is. If you've never heard of work design before, you should definitely check out this episode to learn more about it. I think it will become increasingly a hot topic as CMOs for CMOs as we continue to lead our teams into the future of work. And this smart work design framework really encompasses all the elements that you should be thinking about to create meaningful work for your team, to help them perform at their best, and to help manage the stress and workload on the team. Lastly, we touch on what managers can do to become better remote managers. I think it's fair to say that many of us have been thrown into the deep end of remote management and perhaps we might not know whether we're doing it well or not. So Sharon shares a few tips um, to help you in that journey. Sharon is a highly distinguished professor of organizational behavior. Sharon is an ARC Laureate Fellow and in 2019 was named among the world's most influential scientists by the Web of Science Group. So tune into this episode to find out why Sharon is so well regarded and to get the practical tips you can use to better design work for your team to increase their motivation and performance and help manage their stress. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Lean Mean Marketing Teams with Ty Hayes, where you'll hear from leading CMOs and thought leaders about what it takes to create a high-performance marketing team. This podcast is brought to you by Growth Generators, a consulting firm that helps CMOs design and build modern marketing teams that drive growth. If you need help optimizing your marketing team, head to growthgenerators.io. Now, let's get on to the show. Welcome Sharon Parker, Director for the Centre for Transformative Work Design at Curtin University here in Perth to the Lean Mean Marketing Teams podcast. Thank you very much, Ty. It's great to be here. I recently undertook one of your exec ed, um, courses at Curtin Ran on work design. Uh-huh. It really piqued my interest in this, so I'm really excited to have you on the show. Sharon, you've got a really distinguished career. I'd love for you to take us back to what piqued your interest in organisational behaviour and give us a high-level overview of your career today. Yeah, that's great. So I guess I did a psychology degree um, here at University of Western Australia. And honestly, I I have to say that the career choice was pretty random in that I had this weird criteria that I, sh- that I deserved a job that was um, paying more than $26,000. I can still remember that. So I applied for jobs that um, had that salary. And I got two, and one was as a youth worker with troubled youth, and the other one was as a research assistant um, down at Curtin University, actually. And I ended up choosing that. Uh, So that was the first random choice. Um, And so I started working um, on the topic, actually, of job design, and I remember going to the library to look it up because I had absolutely no idea what it was. Um, And then I had made another random decision, which was that um, someone came along from Sheffield uh, University and said, why don't you do a PhD um, in the UK? And I thought, oh, that sounds a nice way to travel around the world. So I applied for a bunch of scholarships and things and I got it. And I I then did embark on this PhD in Sheffield. And um, so it was really completely by accident that I ended up doing that PhD. But during that time, I did, I guess I did discover Um, how much and how important work is to people. So I was working with, you could imagine, I don't know if you know much about Sheffield, but it's, you know, an old industrial town, a steelworks town. Um, And so I actually worked with some of the steel working companies that were in decline um, at that time because things were changing. Really worked intensely with people on the shop floor and so on. And one of the um, companies that I actually worked with was an electronics company down in Leicester. And they were introducing self-managing teams, actually. And um, in my PhD, I got to sort of track that change um, and interview people throughout that change. And I was just astounded by 
how much um, that change shifted people. So, you know, in the research at that time, it was all about how self-managing teams can make you more satisfied and so on. But what I observed was that it wasn't just about people getting more satisfied, they were more energised, they had voice, they, were, they had ownership, they cared about their customers. Um, and, and in fact, they talked to me about things like, you know, I've become an adult since self-managing. I've grown up, you know, I used to be a child in this company and now I'm an adult. And I mean, um, the, the degree to which that change was transformative, I think just really was something that hooked into me. And I think the rest of my career, pretty much, I've been trying to, you know, find ways to transform work because I believe that when work is good, it is transformative. And, um, you know, unfortunately, there are not many examples like that, you know, I've subsequently discovered a lot of misery in work, um, you know, but it was really that that led me actually to do research on that topic, um, but other topics as well, but fundamentally about work and how to make it better. Um, over the many years um, in Sheffield, but back in Sydney, and then I went back to Sheffield again as the director of the research institute that I'd been at, um, and then back to Perth. Um, and then finally, I uh, was lucky enough um, four years ago to get what's called a Laureate Fellowship, um, which is the Australian Research Council's sort of one of the, the highest level um, fellowships that you can get. And that enabled me to have the resources to set up the Centre for Transformative Work Design, which really sort of closed the loop on that initial journey, you know, as a PhD student, discovering the power of transforming work, and then the opportunity to set up this centre yeah. to really, really explore that deeply. Fantastic. Yeah, and we spend so much time at work, don't we? And I'm sure many of the listeners have been in fantastic roles and roles that aren't so good. And there's so many elements that have an impact on that. But you know that when you find your sweet spot that's you know the right combination of your skills and passion and the right culture and the right team and you are empowered it can have so many flow on effects to your happiness and motivation so i can see how that, how that gripped yeah. you from the beginning and yeah um yeah and how you continue to do research in this fascinating area yeah now uh for the audience's benefit again can you tell them a little bit about the center for transformative work design based in the future of work institute at curtin university and the center is all about um, redesigning work to make work better for people um, and, and, and we do both research and practice so um, which is a bit unusual actually I'm sure you've heard of the criticism of academics being in the ivory tower and not being in touch with the real world um, we have very deliberately wanted this centre to be um, high quality research because that's really important there's a lot of evidence and unfortunately managers and so on often don't use it but we really wanted that quality research but we also want to actually make work better for people so we have um, we've employed multiple organizational psychologists who are not researchers but who are practitioners um, and so we have a big focus on industry work um, as well uh, so yeah fundamentally we are about um, creating good work because good work matters. Yeah, fantastic. Now, having done some research into your background and, and considering what may be a benefit for the audience in these current times, uh, I think there's three topics I'd love to dive into if we get time. The first one is the future of work due to technological transformation, and I'm sure that's kind of been accelerated by the pandemic currently. The next one is smart work design and some of the kind of top-down and bottom-up approaches to work redesign how these impact on employees and organisational performance. And last one, which is kind of tied to both of those, is how to become a better remote manager. You know, I think a lot of us have been thrust into this new way of working and new way of managing. Um, but if there's any tips or strategies, we can give the managers out there to do, do that better so they can help their teams perform at their best. How does that sound? That sounds fantastic. Three things I could talk all day about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so into the future of work then. Um, I think many of us would have tasted a bit of the future of work during the COVID-19 pandemic as it relates to kind of remote and hybrid working. So two of the outcomes from that. But from a higher level, can you can you talk to us a little bit about what, what does the future of work look like in the next 10 to 20 years? You know, what, can, what changes can staff and managers expect to see? Yeah, uh, digitalization is the biggest one, really. And you alluded to that in terms of flexible working. And we've been so sort of successful with that, you know, in large part because of technology. 
um, that's really facilitated that. But, you know, we are seeing automation, artificial intelligence. We are seeing decisions being made through algorithms. This is really the biggest change uh, that is ahead. And I guess what's different, historically, automation really automated physical work, but what we've seen is it's automating cognitive work. So we are seeing it influencing journalism and accounting and research and all sorts of um, knowledge professions. So that's the big change that's happening. I think another big change that's worth mentioning as well, though, is the ageing workforce. Um, I know that's not scheduled for something for us to talk about today, but it's really important because by 2050, um, almost one third of Australian population will be older than 60. Mm. So one third will be older than 60 uh, in, in about 30 years. So mm. we are not really geared up for that. And we really need to be looking at, um, from an economic perspective, it's really important that we keep mature workers in work, being healthy and productive, because otherwise we'll have a very small working population that's got this enormous productivity burden, I guess, of generating enough income to care for the the large uh, ageing aging population, you know, with health issues and so on. So we really, that's a really big factor that's also going to affect us, but it's sort of a silent thing that's already yeah. happening, but we don't hear so much about no. it as we do about digitalization. Yeah. So a, a big change forthcoming. It's a complex one as well, isn't it? Because it, it requires a mindset shift of, of managers and that multi-generational management, you know, uh, younger Absolutely. generations managing older generations and and breaking through some of the stereotypes to actually harness the diversity and experience that those workers have and see how you can, you know, how they could add a real asset and, and skill set and capability to your team, but it takes Absolutely. a real mind, mindset shift. Um, it does. And it also takes, you know, thinking about what sort of work is going to attract mature workers yeah. because, you know, they've got grandchildren and they've got other things they might want to mm. do with their time. So if we need collectively to keep people in work longer and being productive, mm. um, what's going to keep them there? So all sorts of fascinating questions yeah. there, maybe for another topic yeah. for another yeah. day. Yeah, it could be a whole episode. <laughs> Um, and how big of an impact has COVID-19 had on fast tracking the future and, and bringing into the current state some of these things that may have been five or 10 years out and they've really been accelerated? Yeah, and we've seen that, haven't we, yeah. with um, not just sort of technology that we use to do remote work, which, mm. you know, has, of course, had a huge um boost through this time, but organisations that have had to go online for shopping or service delivery and even digital manufacturing during this time, you know, how on earth do you make something when you're not there? But there's been this huge rise of creating ways of getting things, you know, almost assembled and so on. Um, so, there's, so there's been a huge acceleration and we're going to see it, um, you know, ramp up more and more and more. Um, I think there have been a couple of other things that the pandemic has highlighted as well that are relevant to work. And one of them is the importance of mental health. So we were really seeing the recognition of that um, before starting to emerge, you know, because we have this statistic that, you know, one in five Australians are suffering from mental ill health. Um, but during COVID, this has become even clearer and stronger. And we, we did see a doubling of that statistic during um, COVID. And, and managers noticed that, you know, they noticed that their employees and, and things were struggling. So that's another change that's really come onto the table. And I think related to that, um, work design has got a lot of attention because suddenly people are saying, gosh, we still need Australia or our different countries, we need them to be competitive and productive. They're all having to work from home. How do we do that? How do we manage that? How do we do that successfully? And that's really brought to the surface a lot of these questions around, well, how, how do you design work if people are not in the office? So I think there've been a few um, things that have changed during this time, all of which I have to say have been great for us yeah, as organisational yeah. psychologists. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right in the middle of it. It's coming back to one of the points you made earlier around the future of work, so the automation and new algorithms and, and more cognitive uh, jobs and skills being replaced. If you bring that back, I guess, to marketers, there are many marketers that are writers, designers, content creators, and we actually use a lot of automation tools in ad buying and um, email marketing and social and things like that. But are there any trends in terms of roles that maybe 
uh, more exposed, I guess, and more at risk due to AI than others. And what can marketers do to almost future-proof themselves to either use AI to augment what they do or to protect themselves a little bit from this? Yeah, it's a really, really important question because, as I mentioned, we're seeing a lot more automation of cognitive work, but it is still that more routine, predictable cognitive work. And so um, in the end, you know, creativity, problem solving, human connection, all those things still remain really important. What is going to, what's a sort of meta capability that's going to be important for everyone is um, whether you call it agility or whether you call it adaptivity, learning focus. Um, We're all going to need to be willing to shift, change, learn new things more so than ever in the past. And so, and we've seen that actually during COVID. We had to quickly adapt to using new technologies to communicate and so on. But that is a trend into the future. So one of the most important meta skills, I think, for people in the future is um, is that agility and openness to learning. And, and that comes with mindsets around sort of willingness to try new things, be open and, and not think that just because you've had your training in one area that you're set for life. That's just not true anymore. Um, the, the other thing I think it would be, you know, great to talk about is, is the choices that we make about how we use technology in the workplace are going to become really, really important. So I think traditionally um, the focus, or certainly in the media, you know, the focus is on how many jobs are we going to lose and which jobs are going to be re- replaced. But a more helpful way to think about it is not so much that whole jobs will be replaced, but that tasks within jobs will be replaced. So um, some estimates are that 30% of tasks in 60% of jobs will be automated. So what that means is we need to start thinking more about how do we organise our work? How do we design our work, given we've got you know, technology increasingly taking mm. up um, mm. opportunities. So what what tasks should we assign the robot versus yeah. the human? Those yeah. sorts of questions are going to become really more and more important into yeah. the future. Yeah. yeah. And in some ways they're a bit connected, aren't they? Because the adopting the growth mindset, um, Carol Dweck versus the, the fixed mindset and being open to change and open to learn and test and learn and not afraid to fail. You know, you can then transfer that over to embracing technology in terms of looking at which tasks it could automate. And if you get your work design right, how that could actually remove some of the more mundane tasks perhaps and make your work more exciting by leveraging technology and and using your strengths, whether it be the creative side or the empathy or the, you know, relationship building. Um, but, But you need that growth mindset not to see that as a threat. You need the growth mindset and you Mm. also need the approach to technology Mm. that enables that. And so we have a beautiful example of that. We've been looking at diagnosis of rare diseases um, and doing a project around that. And um, here a program was set up that actually rapidly increased the extent to which rare diseases were diagnosed. And at first everyone assumed, oh, it's the technology because they'd introduced this patient archive that has sort of has records from all over the world. But it actually turned out that what was really important was that they'd redesigned the teams and they'd actually um, brought together all the specialists to work together as a team. And that was really creating these sort of aha moments and, oh, it could be this. But what was really important in that example was they talked about that the patient archive, this fancy technology, was just one voice. So it wasn't making the decision. It wasn't doing the diagnosis. It was one voice in the process. And that is a way of using technology where you really are augmenting human performance. Unfortunately, we also see many examples of technology being used in a way that it actually Um, makes jobs very de-skilled, takes away the opportunity for human judgment. So, you know, we are are seeing um, examples like, um, you know, people's technology being used to monitor 
exactly where people are, technology being used to monitor the degree to which people have got empathy in their voice. And then, you know, all this sort of thing being used then to control people and to make them work harder and faster and without breaks and so on. So we've got, we've got a situation where technology can be a wonderful enabler of human performance, but it also can be designed and implemented in a way that really um, sort of um, takes away what's human uh, um, in, in people's work and makes the work, you know, terrible it can also result in big accidents and things like that too um, so you know there have been some examples actually we've learned a lot from aviation about the automation in in planes um, that has has helped us to learn that um, you can't just completely automate plane flying because what happens is when the automation fails then the pilot actually cannot really remember how to fly. So we've really got to think about, um, it's not just about individual mindsets, although that's really important. Yeah. It's also about the choices that managers make yeah. around the yeah. technology and how it's used. Yeah. So I'm not sure if I've articulated yeah. that very well, but it's a really important thing into the future. Yeah, yeah. it make, makes sense. I guess with power comes responsibility and a lot of these tools do have a lot of power, don't they? And it kind of, comes back to the ethics of, of how you use it and the values of the organization and yeah how you choose it to help enable your team and, and your yeah so, so use it for good rather than bad exactly and you know so like one comment you know is this idea that the choice in some jobs will be you know being replaced by a robot mm. or being treated like one mm. you know we need we need to we need to recognize what humans can do and create jobs where they can actually do mm. it and not just try to control every yeah. micro movement and, and so on. Yeah. So yeah. And I, and I love some of your other comments around the um the ex the example in the rare diseases. And I think I think I remember reading some of the research, this socio technological kind of redesign or systems thinking approach. And it ties in, I think, to a lot of um some of the training consulting I do around agile and agile marketing, yeah. bringing cross functional teams together with all the right skill sets to approach a task and shed new light on it and, and work together in a more effective way than they could in isolation. So I liked. Absolutely. And it's, it's about that human, the team and with tool, mm. with, with technology as a tool, not with tech, a lot of the organizations we work with, the primary focus is on, although they'll never say it like this, but it really is, how many people can we get rid of through introducing this technology? And that's the wrong mindset because that just leads to this idea that humans are replaceable, let's get rid of them, um, rather than saying, how can we use this technology to do the work better um, and, and make the work better for humans at yeah. the same time? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the mindset shift yeah. we really need to see. It's funny when I was rolling out marketing automation and other things in my previous role as a CMO, you know, I'd get questions at times from executive, well, if we're automating marketing, yeah, how many stuff can we get rid of? But then I had to carefully explain that this just allows us to be more personalized and more customer centric and offer a better proposition and experience to our customers. But it still takes the thinking and the creative to put in place the right, you know, sequences and, and provide that rich experience. It's not about letting robots do your marketing we've seen there's this sort of notion that um that you know if we have algorithms and so on to make decisions it's going to all be more objective and it's going to be better we've seen many dramatic examples of that not being true because in the end algorithms are just based on data and um, that doesn't make them less biased in fact they can be more biased so you know i'm sure you're familiar with for example the I think it was, um, I think Google was sending, using big data to target high paying advertisements and they went mostly to men um, rather than women because historically men have had the high paying jobs. But so all well, that use of that data to make that marketing or advertising decision, you know, is just increasing bias in society it's not so so we have to also move away from thinking that just because it's done by a computer or a robot it's somehow more objective or better um and look at the robo debt thing in australia you know that's another example 
of where you know allowing too much automation and taking out human judgment altogether yeah. can can result in really negative consequences absolutely and um mm. yeah the show like the social dilemma and the algorithms in social feeds and how people only see certain news and how that's creating divide around the world is yeah scary. absolutely it's scary to take that to the next level as well i might switch gears over to smart work design can you start by giving the audience a definition of what what work design is, and then we'll get into this smart work design framework that you've helped um, create. Yeah. Well, work design is about how the tasks and responsibilities and activities that people do in their work is organised and what the nature of those tasks and activities and responsibilities are. So, you know, if you're a police officer um, and you're looking at police officer work, what should the police officer do versus um, the support staff? Um, who should make the decisions, the police officer or the next level up? Which police officers should work together as a team? And if they do work together as a team, should they be specialised or should they be multi-skilled? These are all examples of work design questions, you know. And so, you know, to take it back to what we were just talking about, those questions about should what should the robot do? Mm. Um, who, who should make the decisions, the human or the robot? Those are all questions of, yeah. of work design. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for that. And now I understand you've uh, actually established a work design framework called the Smart Work Design Framework. Can you tell us a bit about that and maybe briefly describe each of those elements in the mnemonic? Great. Yeah. So I guess I've mentioned what work design is. Yeah. And one of the ways that we've traditionally sort of analysed work design is to measure aspects of people's job. So if I was analysing your work design, Ty, I might ask you how much variety do you have in your work? I might ask you how much autonomy do you have? I might ask you, um, do you have to connect with other people? I might ask you, do you get to see the benefits of your work? And so on and so forth. And so um, historically, we've measured more than 30 different aspects of work to try and really get at, is this a psychologically motivating work design? Is it a work design that's going to cause you stress? Is it a work design that's going to help you grow and learn and develop? So, but obviously 30 different aspects is a lot. And um, so we needed to sort of boil it down. So we did some research that identified that there's five sort of overarching categories um, that we can think about to create good work. And then, um, and then I was sort of thinking about how to convey those categories and the, you know, the smart goal, you know, the specific measurable, et cetera, popped into my mind. And I thought, what if we had smart work design? And so um, really just match those five categories onto the SMART. And that's what um, so it sort of gave us this nice practical model, but that is really grounded in lots and lots of research. Wow, there's been a lot covered in this interview so far. As a marketing leader, we know you like to spend more time taking action and less time taking notes. So we've got you covered. We packaged up all the tips, strategies and resources from each episode into some beautifully crafted notes just for you. Not ugly AI generated transcripts, but real notes taken by a real person on our team. To grab the notes, head on over to growthgenerators.io, look out for this podcast episode and download the notes. But be quick, they're only live for a few weeks after the episode airs. Now, back to the show. Shall I go through? Yeah, take us through them, starting with S. Yeah, excellent. So the first one is S for stimulating. Mm. And that's about having work that's interesting, challenging, got variety, uses your skills, develops your skills and so on. And human beings are, in a sense, you know, wired for interest and novelty. And we adapt very quickly, you know, if we're exposed to... Um, some sort of um, work, you know, after a while we sort of adapt and then we start getting a bit bored with it. So it's really important that we feel that our work is stimulating. And of course, what's stimulating to one person might not be stimulating Mm. to another. And that's good, right? Because that enables us to have teams where, you know, some people love doing data crunching and other people love doing, you know, fancy whiz-bang presentations. (laughs) M is for mastery. And this is really about... um, Everybody wants to do well, you know, in their work. They want to master their job. Um, But what they need to do that is they need to know what it is they're responsible for. They need to know what their role is and they need to have clarity about that. Um, And they also then need to get some feedback about how they're doing in their role. 
And they also need to understand, well, how does what I do fit in with what other people do to contribute to the organisation? And when people have that knowledge about what they're trying to do and how they're doing, then they can perform and really master their work. So actually, a whole bunch of research shows that, um, for example, if people don't have clarity, so they don't know what it is they're meant to be doing, that's extremely stressful. Um, and actually contributes to burnout and, you know, some of those um, mental health outcomes that I alluded to earlier. So getting things clear, giving people good feedback is, is yeah. um, what mastery is all yeah. about. And it sounds basic, doesn't it? But you'd be surprised how many organisations, individuals just don't have a performance plan that's up to date. Or, or a really clear job description that's been updated in the past two years and or yeah. re regular one-to-ones with their you know, manager to get clear direction. So it sounds sounds so basic, but but it's easy to get wrong. Yeah. And we think of we think of feedback as something you get once a year, you know, in your yeah. performance appraisal. But feedback should be something you get all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and even you know, job descriptions, you know, I think sometimes are not the focus because they're so easily out of date. It's really about being clear. What is it that you're trying to achieve? You know, you you don't necessarily want to be in a job where you're clear about every tiny little step because actually that can make the job very unstimulating and, and, and so on. Um, but you need to be clear, what is it you're trying to deliver here? What's the outcome you're shooting for? That's particularly important. So that's the M. Um, a is for agency. Um, and that's about having control and influence and autonomy in your work. Actually, um, I would have liked to have called that autonomy, but these, we work in Perth and, you know, there's a lot of conversation about autonomous trucks and in the yeah, mines yeah, and all this yeah. sort of thing. And I've had a few conversations with people where I realised yeah. I'm talking about human autonomy yeah. and they're talking about machine autonomy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, okay, Easy. we're going to call mm. this agency. Mm. And so this is about people having responsibility to make decisions and the opportunity to do so. Um, for example, uh, flexible working is a great example of agency in terms of you have some influence over where you work, um, whether you work at home, whether you work in your office. Ideally, you would have some influence over when you work so you can adjust your hours. Of course, it's got to fit with the with the other requirements of the work, but as much as possible, flexibility over when you work. And then having some autonomy over the decisions, how you do your work, what ta what order you're going to do your tasks in, how you're going to do them. And I mean, this really goes back to a fundamental human need that people have for control and for influence. Um, you know, and if you want to really, really make life miserable for people and, you know, think about things like concentration camps, and th they're all about taking away human control, you know. So um, in our workplace, unfortunately, as I said before, we, we sometimes see, um, you know, technology being used to take away control by monitoring people and checking up on them all the time and so on. So A is a big one. Um, really important one. R is for relational and, and that really recognises that all human beings have this fundamental need to belong, mm. need to uh, connect with other people. Mm. We're social creatures in yeah. the end, even if we're introverted, we're still yeah. social creatures, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so when we're looking at designing work, we need to think about the relational aspects. So is this work where people are going to have some connection with other people? Mm. Are they getting support from their peers? Are they getting support from their managers? Mm. Are they part of a team? Not that you have to be part of a team, but how is the team? Mm. Is it a team where everyone's functioning effectively mm. or is it a team full of conflict and grief, you know? Um, but thinking about these things, um, these relational aspects. And another aspect that's important is... Um, the impact that you have on other people. So again, as human beings, we want to make a difference to the world. And um, are we making that difference? And do we know about that? So, you know, if you're, if you're designing a marketing campaign, you know, feel it knowing how it goes and finding out the positive benefit that it had for the client or for the, the people that, are, that you're trying to target is really, is really important part of work design as well. And sometimes it's just a case of, you never get that information. You never get to find out how it went. But sometimes designing good work is just about connecting you with the, the people who benefit from the work yeah. and giving you a chance to uh, connect with those people. Yeah, yeah. And in um, marketing, we often talk a lot about customer centricity and employee centricity and customer personas and journeys. So I think 
yeah, definitely a lot that our audience will relate to about really deep yeah. understanding the customer needs and, and how whatever your product or service offering is benefits them. Um, and also the EQ that you mentioned, you know, especially managers making sure they've got the right EQ to know what impact they have on their staff in how they behave or manage or lead. Um, and Yeah. And so there was a classic, I'll just mention quickly, a yeah. classic study done by Adam Grant, who you might be familiar with. Um, so um, he did some research on call centre agents. And, you know, as you know, call centre agents often don't have the best design jobs. They can be a bit repetitive. And um, in this particular call centre, actually it was his university call centre, their job was to call up people to try to raise money. And as you can imagine, people say no a lot. So this was a job where the, the agents got rejected continually and the turnover was huge in this organisation. So what um, Adam did was he realised that it was really hard to change agency and all those other things that I'm talking about in the model. Um, so instead what he decided to do was to focus on how does this work benefit people? And of course, if you're, if you're in a call centre and what you're doing is you're fundraising, you are creating funds for something. And in this case, they were creating funds for um, underprivileged people to come to university. So what they did is they brought in these people into the workplace so that the call centre agents could meet people and hear the stories of how the funds that they had generated really made a difference to their lives. And, um, and then the, Adam showed that this resulted in um, less turnover, more money generated, more job satisfaction, more motivation amongst the staff. So that's just an example of how, if you think creatively, sometimes you yeah. can help people to see the impact of their yeah. work. I've heard other examples as well in you know the marketing sense where someone from the brand team may go on and be on the customer support line for the day and vice versa. So you get that um, firsthand interaction. And I know when I was um, at Curtin University, one of the favorite times for me was open day. You know, when you're actually yeah. interacting face to face with um, star, uh, with future students that are, you know, excited about their career and, and just talking directly to get that. Um, and it's so it's important like, mm. and we can forget that. So yeah. that's one thing. And then T is for tolerable demands. So mm. in all work, we have demands, you know, that sort of definition of work, right? Um, you know, you've got goals that you've got to achieve and that requires some effort. And that might be cognitive effort, might be thinking a lot, might be concentrating hard. It might be emotional. You know, if you're a nurse, you're dealing with emotional demands. It could be just the sheer amount of work, you know, lots of long hours or whatever. Um, and, of course, those demands exist, but they need to be tolerable. They need to be demands that you can cope with, um, that don't exceed your, your personal resources. And when, when those demands get intolerable, we will see all sorts of mental health issues. So I was just going to mention right now in Australia, um, you know, the, the fastest growing area of workers' compensation is in mental health. So mental health related issues at work. And then within that, the biggest cause of mental health problems in work <clears throat> is to do with excess demands. So, you know, too much pressure, too long working hours, um, et cetera, and, and, and so on. So tolerable demands is not about saying we can't have any demands in our work. That's what work is. But it's about making sure that those demands are manageable and tolerable for people mm -hmm. um, and don't exceed their resources. So that's the smart model. So basically, if you're a manager and you can sort of yeah. think about all those sorts of things, um, you're going to have pretty good work for people. Yeah, excellent. So just to recap, we had S for stimulating, M for mastery, A for agency, R for relational, and T for tolerable demands. And you've touched on it there, but I think there's at least three major benefits if managers get this right. What are, what are some of those high-level benefits of implementing smart work design? Yeah, the first one is motivation. Yeah. You know, and, and we're talking here about intrinsic motivation. So not, not extrinsic motivation. That, that comes from things like salary and bonuses, which, uh, again, another topic, but they, they, are not, they do not sustain good performance in organisations. What sustains good performance in organisations is intrinsic motivation, which is that internal desire to do your job well. And, and things especially like innovation and creativity, you know, you cannot coerce someone, you know, yeah. be creative, yeah. right? Yeah. That has to come from in the, yeah. the, the inner yep. side. Mm -hmm. So motivation and then the, all the benefits that spin from motivation, performance, innovation, 
people leaving, less likely to quit, all those sorts of things. So that's the number one uh, benefit. Um, number two is mental health and, and well-being. Um, and that's so important. And we know that already. And I mentioned workers' compensation claims. So that's got a big cost to organisations that everyone's starting to worry about. But, you know, from a more personal perspective, um, it, there's evidence that shows, for example, if people are exposed to work stress, they're more likely to have cardiovascular ill health. They're more likely to have heart attacks, in other words. So, you know, there's a health benefit as well. In fact, there's a nice uh, book by Jeffrey Pfeffer that came out recently about jobs that kill. And it basically um, worked out how much all of these work characteristics that I've been talking about, what the effect is, both from a financial perspective, but from a mortality perspective. And I can't cite the statistics offhand, but when jobs are badly designed, it enhances your chance of mortality. So stress and well-being is really important, especially around that tolerable demands. Um, when they get too much, mental health suffers, which I think is, again, just as important, especially in light of that conversation we just had about the future of work, um, is learning and development. When work is well designed and it's stimulating and you've got autonomy and you get feedback, you know, you learn and you grow and you develop. Um, and that's so important. You know, we, we tend to think in organisations about training. Oh, let's send person X on training. Sometimes the best training is the training that you get in the job through the work that you do. But if you're sitting in a, in a job and you're micromanaged and you've got no opportunity to use your initiative and it's boring, you know, you're not going to learn. Um, I'm thinking, you know, back to when I talked about, you know, working in Sheffield, one of the companies, we did some work in a wire making company where they introduced sort of a form of self-managing teams. And I always remember the um, manager so, you know, I talked to him about, well, what were the benefits and downsides, et cetera, of this initiative? And what he said to me, one of the biggest benefits was we realised we had stars on the shop floor. You know, in other words, there were people there with talent, but when they were in these really confined jobs where they didn't have a uh, smart work design in a sense, um, they couldn't show their talent. And when they, when they introduced more self-managing teams, they saw people's talent and they discovered, wow, actually we're smart. Yeah. And if I can just give one more example, I know we're yeah. getting short on no, time, but um, another example, a, a, a woman a journalist in the US, and I can't remember her name, it will come to me. But anyway, she had a PhD from a big American university and so on, but she decided to see whether she could live off the, um, off the wage in America. So she went sort of undercover, I suppose, for six months and worked in these very like low level jobs like um, Walmart and cleaning. And she made the decision, um, and th that was the point of the book, to see if she could live off a wage. And by the way, she couldn't. Um, but what I thought was fascinating about the book was she made this decision to do the best she could. And she thought, someone is gonna notice that I've got capability. You know, I've got a PhD from, I can't remember where it was, Stanford or something, I can't remember. Um, and no one ever noticed. Um, people's jobs are not des designed to allow talent to shine, it won't. And so um, I think that cre creating learning opportunities is one of the real benefits of good work design. And that goes back to where we started with the future work conversation. In the future, we need people who are open to learning and agile and mm. developing and growing. Mm. So let's create the sort of work that's going to enable them yeah, to do that. Absolutely. And Coming back to the managers and leaders then, so given all these fantastic benefits and we've got an overview of the model, what is one or two things they can do or where should they start to know how to apply this? I assume it's not as simple as going through through the mnemonic one by one, but yeah, where, where should they start in learning how to apply this? To well, I actually think that's not a bad start. All work design needs to begin with diagnosis. You know, so what are the issues? Because every place is a bit different and people are always different. So, you know, if you've got a small team of 10 people or something, um, actually, if you go onto our website, smartworkdesign.com.au, um, there's a little survey you can do for free that you can diagnose. Um, but you can literally just talk with your team about each of the elements and understand where people are at. I mean, obviously, people have got to feel safe to have that conversation. And sometimes that's where you might 
value a consultant or something or someone independent. But diagnosis is always a starting point. So, you know, what is our work design like right now? Where are we strong? Where are we not so strong? And then, of course, it's a case of saying, okay, well, actually, we're all overloaded here or whatever. Um, so let's now talk about how we're going to deal with that. And, of course, how you then deal with that depends. I mean, if we're talking about a whole organisation, you're probably going to need some systematic guidance in how to, 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 to do that. But if you're a, a, a local you know, manager and you've got your 10 people and people are overloaded, you know, a really good starting point is asking people, well, what do you think would help? Uh, let's look at um, the demands. How, is there some things we can do more efficiently? Is there some things that we're doing that we don't really need to do? Uh, um, one of the things with intolerable demands is it's not always about reducing demands as well. One thing that makes demands more tolerable is the other, other elements of the model. So as you would probably know yourself, Ty, if you've got a lot of demands, but you've also got autonomy over those demands and you can choose how you're going to handle them and when, that actually makes them a lot more tolerable. So, you know, you might also explore other things, not just reducing demands, but other strategies that are going to make those demands more manageable. Um, because one of the things about creating good work is you have to involve the people who do the work. I know that sounds so obvious, but I cannot tell you the number of times I've worked with organisations where I say that and they get really anxious because they're like, oh, no, we don't want, we get people all uncertain and, yeah. you know, let's work it out. Let's work out what the change is going to be yeah. and then let's tell them. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm like, well, no, they're the people who do the work. Yeah, they're close. They to need, it. you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, one of the socio technical systems principles that comes from the 1950s, mm. where they introduced self managing teams um, in coal mines and so on, is, you know, if you're trying to create work where people are um, engaged and innovative and have ownership, the way you create that work should be compatible. If you want people to have autonomy, if that's what you're trying to create, give them autonomy in the creating of the work. Um, that's not to say you can't um, benefit from having some expertise involved and some different perspectives, because sometimes, you know, um, people in the work themselves, they, you know, they're used to doing it that way and they can't see other ways. Yeah. Um, but it is, it's really important to involve people. So yeah. even though it's so obvious, it's also very rare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hundred percent agree, and you know, I'm a big fan of the kind of design thinking approach where you diverge, converge, diverge, converge, and go through that discover, you know, kind of stage. And and, and you know, with work design, design yeah, it's mm. it's so true. And evaluate, you know, try yeah. things and evaluate. You yeah. know, there's no there's no perfect work design. There will always be some trade offs. You know. Um, also, you, could, you make changes and then you should review, well, this is how they're going. Um, is it making our work smarter or actually, you know, uh, is it not really working? So that design thinking mindset can really, really strongly be applied to work design as well. Um, and not thinking, oh, we're going to get it right. We're going to yeah. write it down in the job description and that's it. That's it. You know, yeah. that's not the way to do it. No. Con <laughs> constant evolution. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, we are running short of time, Sharon. It's been such a I told you I'd talk too much, didn't I? <laughs> no, no, not at all. I've loved the conversation. Um, I wonder if we can squeeze in maybe one or two tips before we get into the fast five. Just what can a manager listening to this do to become a better remote manager in these current times? And then we'll get into our fast five and wrap up. Yeah, so I think, um, and one of the things we've written a few papers actually on applying the SMART model to flexible working because, you know, there's been this sort of discussion, should there be flexible working or not? You know, but that's not really the right question. The right question is really, how do we make the work, whether it's at home or in the office or both, and that's probably the ideal, how do we make sure that it's good quality and smart? So uh, just one thing, for example, it, we, we did a big study um, and all the results, by the way, are on our website and lots of resources. We just released actually a whole bunch of resources for managers on how to manage remote work so people can go to the website and get those. Um, but, you know, one of the things, just as an example, was we observed around about 25% of managers were really um, micromanaging people. Um, so even though they were not, in fact, probably because they were not in the office, managers were feeling worried, they're not working. And so they were sort of expecting people to be 
at their desk all the time and if they call them to answer instantly, you know, otherwise thinking they were down off playing golf or whatever. And so managers were not very effective at um, managing people when they couldn't see them. And to be fair, managers were thrust into this situation without training or preparation and so on and so forth. So um, one of the important things to learn is to more manage by results, you know, um, rather than manage by inputs, as in manage by, you know, the person sitting at their desk working and instead focus on what are the outputs, our outcomes that are being delivered. And I mean, that's actually important in knowledge work anyway, right? Because a person can, can sit at their desk all day long and just have a big dream, you know, and they can look like they're working. Uh, but they're not really. So it's all about what people actually deliver at the end of the day. So that would be one tip, um, um, you know, make sure you're, you know, trusting people and managing by results, not by, by outputs. If I could just throw in one other one, um, um, the importance, I guess, of support during this time, especially, you know, in Perth, we've been so lucky, um, but in those places where COVID is still, very much, you know, um, rife. People need a lot of support. People are worried about catching public transport. People are worried about their health and all those sorts of things. And so the importance of managers just checking in. So not checking up, but checking in. And, and I think that that is another really powerful behaviour that managers can engage in. And a lot did it early, but then it sort of faded off. They got a bit bored with it and stuff, but it's still important. Yeah. So... I think those 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 are two that I'll focus on. There's lots more we could yeah. talk about, but those mm -hmm. are those are two key yeah. ones. I think, I think yeah. the first one reminds me that you know a lot of people, that some people are night are night hours and others are larks, right? And if you do actually use this as an opportunity to give people a little bit more flexibility in the hours they choose to work, you may actually get more productivity and results out of people that you know nine to five may not be their most productive time. And we actually found that we asked yeah. people about their productivity yeah. and about one third report being more productive. Mm. And then we delve into why. And it's mm. most often because they've got that flexibility to sort their work out around their other demands and to fit their preferences. And also, of course, saving time commuting and so on, but putting that back into their work because they're intrinsically motivated, right? <laughs> lots, that, lots that you can do to yeah. make that a better experience. Yeah. And the checking yeah. in, yeah, so important, especially yeah. with remote and, and working out the best way to do that, whether it's email, phone call, Zoom, dropping by, whatever may be appropriate um, to yeah. touch on that relational element in the smart framework. Yeah, so, absolutely. Fantastic, Sharon. Well, we're up to the fast five. Are you ready? Okay. Yes, I'm okay. ready. So I have to be fast. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what do you believe are three essential capabilities or criteria of a high performance team? The first is um, shared vision. People mm -hmm. need to know where they're going. Mm -hmm. So they need to know that output they're aiming for. That's mm -hmm. number one. Yep. Number two, you need to have the sort of complementary skills, personalities, abilities, so that the team is more than the sum of its parts. You know, you want the team to actually deliver more than the individuals within it. And that means they need to have the complementary skills. And then number three, to make that work, is you need people who get on. And so I think you need to give attention to those interpersonal aspects, trust, respect. They're so important for effective teams. And how would you describe a positive team culture in one word? Ooh. Energized. <laughs> Energized, yep. Energized. Yeah, because if you get the smart framework right, then people should be empowered and energized. Exactly. <laughs> so, and what is one metric that you've successfully used to track and measure team performance? Okay, so in our world, mm. performance, one outcome that's very important is publications. Yep. So pu ma ma tracking mm. publications is, yep. is an output yeah. that, that we successfully use to measure performance. Fantastic. And for some of maybe the other clients you've worked out, what is, is there another, like, is it staff engagement or coming back to energised? Is there a specific measure around that that can be useful or a question you, absolutely. There are all sorts of things that yeah. you can measure. And, and in a sense, those are not the ultimate outcomes, but they oh, are really important indicators. for driving those ultimate outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we do regularly measure those sorts of things yeah. as well. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. And what is one skill or capability you've learned recently that you wish you developed much sooner in your career? Okay. This is not a skill or capability. It's a yeah. habit. So... Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I've been trying to work more on my physical exercise yeah. and been successful the last year or so. Yeah. But I wish, you know, when I was 
younger, I wish I'd been better at that. Yeah. Um, but you know, you have all the excuses under the sun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I wish I'd started earlier. Yeah. And you're feeling yeah. more energized because of it. Yeah. Well, yeah. exactly. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. You're so exhausted. You know, I I, I have three children and you know you're managing dual careers and you're exhausted and so you always sacrifice yourself and your health yeah but actually if you do it it Mm. does release energy yeah and i I sort of knew that objectively in the past but i couldn't still couldn't motivate myself yeah now i really know it and i just wish i had (laughs) so hard so hard to prioritize with all those other responsibilities isn't it yeah (laughs) often put your kids first but um I think of the put the oxygen mask on your on yourself first That's and so then true. Your child, so but, it, true. It's high. but it's point. easier said than done. And uh, what book or books have you read that you found yourself recommending to others or that you think the audience may gain value from? Well, so I've been um, I've been running a series for women researchers actually, um, mm. and it's called Small Wins. So it's all about this idea of we're also time poor, etc. Just achieving a small change, but doing it regularly. And so as part of that, I read. Um, BJ Fogg's book called Tiny Habits and um, so and so it sort of relates to that example of exercise as well but just the the, and and the power of creating the right environment as well classic would be if you don't want to eat chocolate don't have it in your house you know or yeah yeah, but but just those very small steps so I've I've been um, I've been enjoying that sort of mindset so Mm. if you want to change just focusing yeah. on those really little, little things. tiny yep. habits yep. and and those are what can can help you in the long term so that's one i've been recommending to people lately brilliant thank you for that and lastly sharon where can people go to get in touch with you or to find out more about yourself your research or the center for transformative work design yeah thank you so um they can connect with me on linkedin um sharon k parker i try to keep that um reasonably up to date and put the research on there and so on but also transformative work design all one word dot com is the website where we where we put lots of our research and so on and connect to that smart model um, that people might be interested in fantastic and i've had a look around that website and it is filled with great research and uh, resources so i encourage people to check that out and all those links will be in the show notes as well Well, Sharon, thank you so much for your time today, Uh, a topic I'm very interested in. I think our audience will be today exceptionally pertinent at the moment um, while the pandemic is still ongoing and work design is changing, how to be a better remote manager, implementing the smart work framework. I think there were a lot of tips and skills and insights that uh, our listeners can, can implement. So thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Ty. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to Lean Mean Marketing Teams with Ty Hayes. If you love the show, please remember to hit subscribe so that you can discover more tips and strategies to build a high-performance marketing team. And if you're feeling generous, please tell someone about the show who you think would benefit. We're on a mission to help CMOs build their dream team and enable marketers to do their best work. And we appreciate your help in spreading the word.